Hello and welcome to the Large and Unnecessary First Player Token Podcast. This is episode 109. My name is Chris. I'm Ewan. I'm Dave. <laughs> no, I'm <Whoa>. not. <laughs> I'm sure we've done this joke a few times now, Pavel. Uh, I'm sure yeah. you and Dave do like to mix it up a bit. Oh, come on. It's been like 20 episodes since well, we've done that. You're basically interchangeable. <laughs> is, is this for the people that have jumped on since then that haven't heard you doing that joke before? Actually, that's a good point. Sorry, this is this was uncalled for. It's just um, a fun and joke. Yeah, mm, I'm not Dave, I'm, I'm Pavel. Really. Our joke's fun, you and... Uh, they, are, they are quite fun. <laughs> we do like to have fun on this podcast. <laughs> well, boys, how are you? Well, I'm... I'm, I'm very well. I'm... I'm Better than that. I'm, oh, I'm better than you. And he has to, he has to one up me on everything. Oof, a state of being it feels better already. Well, are you ready to talk about some tabletop games? Because I feel like we haven't done this in a while now. It feels like a while. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna say the game I'd like to talk about can also be laid on your lap. Uh, how, how do you mean? Well, because you know it's RPG. It's what like everything a- that's required to play the game can be put in your lap, including the other players. If you only have one player, then there's not oh, man, much. The, what, what kind of game is this? Oh, man. Sounds more like story time. Is, is this an ERP game? <laughs> well, they're called tabletop RPGs, but I really don't understand what you need tables for. It's it's just nonsense. See, I'm, I'm still completely unsure about what kind of role-playing it is that you do. Well, we've, I've never seen you do it. Yes, that's 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 a safe assumption. And all, all I know is that it's done by you and your better half, and it's done behind closed doors every weekend, <laughs> and nobody's allowed in. Yes, we're, we're very elitist when it comes to uh, <laughs> RPG. <laughs> well, I mean, you, this rumour's been flying around for a while, hmm. but uh, <clears throat> I mean, if, would you ever? I mean, would you ever consider playing? With other people. Now, I've played with you, man. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not entirely sure. I think you you were there. Yeah, but... I felt like you were an observer. I, I want to see your style of play. My style? No, you wouldn't see my style of play in uh, a group RPG thing. I'm sure... Right, okay. I'm sure well, Dave... what if we did one-on-one? Well, one-on-one, there you go, yeah. All right. I'm sure Dave uh, got particularly interested in this subject a few episodes ago as well, <laughs> where he was te- shouting at you saying, well, you don't invite anybody over, Pavel, so how are we supposed to play anything with you? <laughs> It's it's okay. Things are things are fine the way they are. <laughs> I'm sure we're going to start getting letters, letters or emails um, about all the Pavel bashing that we do in this. Someone should write us some letters. <laughs> keep bashing Pavel. Keep, keep bashing. Until we need him some more. Yeah, I'm actually a bit cross that this hasn't happened already. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a bit concerning. We understand, listeners. If you don't send us a letter, we won't stop bashing <laughs> Pavel. <laughs> this, this is very true. Uh, no, that's fine, that's fine. I can take it. I mean, yes, I, I know I can. Okay, well, Hello. we have a couple of board games to talk about in this episode, but we're going to let Pavel do his annual RPG chat. Yeah, we're starting this annual thing fairly early this year, because it's still February, and I already get my, my RPG slot, so by the time I'm done with this review, that's going to be me for the year. Like, why? Like, ah, nah, Pavel. I mean, but we'll get it in early. We'll see if we can maybe slot in a bonus one later on in the year. Maybe December. <laughs> I must the wise begin. <laughs> <laughs> String this one out till next March. I've been baited <laughs> like this many a time. We have to try and keep him on the podcast somehow. Yeah. You know? <laughs> keep dangling that carrot. <laughs> right, stop Stop using up my slots. It's my window now. Oh, yeah, we're I already five minutes in. RPG. <laughs> Right, shut up, yes. <laughs> okay, Pavel, about Pavel. RPG now. Shall I count you in? Shall I count you in? <clears throat> I'm ready. Five. Four, three, two, one. This is the fifth edition of <laughs> The Legend of the Five Rings. My goodness, yes. This particular edition has been released by Fantasy Flight Games, who tend to do very colourful stuff. And well done on the aesthetic side of this newest edition of The Legend of the Five Rings. Although Legend of the Five Rings has traditionally been very well illustrated because the game, well... <sighs> came to be uh, first as a card game. So you need plenty of illustrations for that. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, it's been a good couple of years or decades um, for The Legend of the Five Rings. It's definitely not as ancient as 
um, your shadow run or stuff like that. But uh, the game's seen a number of. Pavel, I have a question. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, no. No, I'm, that's okay. I'm not, I'm open I'm not to trying questions. to put you off. I'm not trying to put you off here, but it's just I, I, I want to know the Legend of the Five Rings, Fantasy Flight. Yes. Yes. Now, do they do anything on top of the the role playing stuff? You said something about a card game. Yes. Right. Is there anything else? Uh, for the Legend of the Five Rings. Yes, because I know that Fantasy Flight like to take these. these yeah, sort of things I know what you mean. Yeah, and there's so many. And do as much stuff with them as possible. Subgenres they do these days, and you know. I think it's just a card game for the legend, uh, to be perfectly honest. I don't. I'm not aware of any actual board games. Uh, I might be mistaken. The card game. Well, I'll look this up then. Yeah, the card game's definitely been around for a very long time and was possibly, potentially, still is for the for this franchise, sort of the main um, a, a channel. But uh, there may have been something, some sort of, I don't know, uh, war game miniature thingy. Pavel's only interested in the RPG. That's what we're here to talk about. You know what? Come to think of it, I probably only play video <laughs> games because of RPGs. Oh, there you go. And board games. Oh, it's you're a, mucking around with a card game. It's all. It's all about the fancy they are. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, <clears throat> Legend of the Five Rings, as the title suggests, because it does. Um, <laughs> is it? Is it? Yes. Yes, it does. Is the RP- is an RPG set in a quasi samurai uh, setting? Oh, so this is- um, with with its uh, with its fantasy world deriving mainly, if not let's well, yeah, mainly from from your mythological and and historical uh, Japan, with some additions from from Chinese Korean culture um, <clears throat> cultures and. Uh, and and plenty of myths, both again, his, well, myths you you do, you tend to know about or learn about when you're learning your your Asian cultures and a lot of other stuff that you'd normally find in your Dungeons and Dragons and bits like this. Um, it's a fifth edition, um, <clears throat> so plenty of uh, revisions. Um, Along the way, we've arrived at what I think is a very coherent, a very sort of back to basics, uh, but also very refined uh, version of of the Legend of the Five Rings. Um, <clears throat> so in this game, you um, essentially play as a member of the samurai uh, caste. Um, in the past, I suppose, in the early editions, though, that essentially only meant... Uh, Abushi, which is your sort of warrior type of uh, class, let's call it, okay. and, a, and a Shugenja, which in uh, um, a Legend of the Five Rings uh, setting is a sort of priest slash mage sort of character. Um, <clears throat> and it's been like this for many editions of, of the Legend of the Five Rings. Nowadays, uh, and mostly because over the years, um, various other sort of takes on on these classes were almost sort of developing subclasses that were unofficial uh, ways of playing uh, Bushi and Shigenjia. So nowadays you actually get to play as a samurai for, uh, that's either a Bushi, a uh, Shugenja, a merchant or artisan, uh, a monk, uh, Shinobi, or um, courtier. And so... Quite a number of different ways to tackle your uh, your your fancy if you if you want to have a bit of a feel of uh, how a fantasy uh, Japanese uh, period drama would uh, would play out. Um, along with uh, with this standardization, standardization, standardized. I don't know. I'm gonna yes. say along with in, yeah. in, in <laughs> introducing yeah, these these additional classes that were previously unofficial. Um, <clears throat> they've um, they came up with uh, again standardized. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Standardized. I'm gonna call them techniques for all the um, all the classes. Whereas previously you were essentially just either a warrior or a priest with various special combat maneuvers or spells. Um, and the fifth edition of, of the Legend of the Five Rings, you're not really treated as a as a secondary citizen uh, when you're playing one of those less 
uh, maybe less direct classes. So if you're a courtier or a um, or a merchant, you actually have your own set of techniques. I would say uh, to choose from when you're creating your your uh, your character when you when you're putting together your character sheet. Um, <clears throat> So again, a lot of work went into diversifying your uh, your choices as uh, as a player, um, which I think is awesome. So well done, on, well done that. It's it's rather difficult for RPGs to shed their um, militaristic roots, I should say. And, uh, as some may know, Dungeons and Dragons uh, came to be from a from a war gaming or a board game, whatever you uh, call it. Um, early exercise and quite a lot of other games um, quite a lot of other RPGs were something else before they became RPGs um, so they tend to just be all about bashing stuff in the head um, The Legend of the Five Rings is just like any other fantasy RPG, you're going to have your share of uh, zombies and demons and goblins to, to slay, so yeah, you tend to uh, unsheath your katana when when it you know, Lord calls for it or your duty calls for it, but there is so much stuff to do there for all the non combat and non spellcasting types as well. It's very nice to see that the um well the, the developers actually thought about all the other players uh, who might choose a different path. Um <clears throat> other than that, uh, things seem to have returned to normal in regards to the world itself. The Legend of the Five Rings takes place in uh, uh and well, quasi-historical, but mostly just fantasy and uh, even mythical uh, land called Rokugan, where um, <clears throat> and that's this is where it sort of deviates from Japan because it's not really an archipelago of fairly slim islands, but rather a fairly sort of massive China-like um, continent um, <clears throat> divided into uh, well clan lands belonging to different. Uh, um, I suppose samurai archetypes, if you think about it, because you've got your 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 crab clan, which is those are these sort of stout, grim, uh, strong uh, warriors, completely devout of few more. You've got your crane clan, and that's um, those are samurai all about aesthetics and and your calligraphy and um, and and very sort of precise uh, yaijutsu swordsmanship. You've got uh, a few other clans, uh, each of them, well, sort of specializing in, in a different aspect of what the Western world tends to associate with, with being a samurai. Yeah? Um, Did you say Rokugan? Rokugan is the name of, of the land. Yeah. Okay, so it turns out that there is a kind of tabletop game <laughs> called Damn. Battle for Rokugan. All right. It's made by fin- uh, Fancy Flights, a turn-based strategy thing. Looks like area control, that kind of thing. Um, so yes, there are more than more than just the the card game for this uh, series, by the looks of it. So there's more stuff out there, Pavel. If you want to go and find it, I might just, I might, yeah, I might just. And are we surprised that Fan, Fan, Fantasy Flights uh, actually did that? We, we're not. We're not surprised we're at not. all because this, this is what Fantasy Flight tends to do with stuff, isn't it? They do. They do kind of like to flog it till it's dead. So we've we've had a chat recently. And then once about... it's dead, did we launch it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've had we've had a chat recently about what's happening in in, in the Cthulhu band and Fantasy Flight and how how similar or different um, <clears throat> games in in that particular franchise are. How many different versions of uh, Arkham Horror you can you can have yeah. a look at? How you can uh, take well assets from one game and utilize them in another? Yeah, that, that's definitely a fantasy flight thing. They do like to recycle mechanics and things in their games. Yeah, um, but right, anyway, sorry. Yeah, moving on. So, um, <clears throat> just just picture your your average uh, well. Sandals and sort fantasy. Uh, put it in a uh, put it in a world with with your uh, fairly uh, well archetypical um, sort of demonic lord wanting to rid the world of the living of the living, um, <clears throat> and you have reasons to obviously to grab your sword and defend your emperor from from the undead, uh, and it's it's been like this for many. Um, um, Editions of of the legend, I suppose, but the game's settings being 
refined over the years, and in the fifth edition, it's actually um, <clears throat> quite uh, quite deep, I would say. Um, and thanks for that, because I actually quite like this uh, this game, and I'm delighted to see it in its uh, in its present form. Um, you don't really get to feel what the world of Rockigan is until you get what seems to be a, a you know an optional book uh, called the guide to the rock again which actually only got released like a few weeks ago um and that's that's your lore book as such um not much about your character creation there a bit obviously uh quite a lot of story hooks but mostly this is your description of what rock again uh, really is, and how your characters and all the other characters should 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 behave in it. Um, <clears throat> and that's something unique to The Legend of the Five Rings as such, because we all, or at least, you know, a number of us uh, in the West, Western Hemisphere have a certain set of, uh, well, I suppose... Uh, archetypes we we tend to think of when we uh, when we picture uh, the the sword and sandal fantasy um quite a lot of misconceptions uh, and generalizations um if you play your average D D, you tend to do the same but if, i suppose in a different way really a warhammer will be your 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 german uh renaissance sort of um fantasy whereas your I don't know, Tolkien world uh, becomes whatever you read in the books. So uh, my point is, my point is we tend to play humans and elves and dwarves uh, in whatever way we fancy, whereas when we, when we get to play samurai, uh, and this is what's been happening for such a long time, we tend to play usually the same person. Uh, it's been, in my opinion, a flow, a, a weakness, not of the game as such, but rather of as players and game masters uh, tackling the Legend of the Five Rings, uh, quite a lot of us really simply didn't know how to do it well because because your your I don't know ancient Japan is, is such a an exotic and such an other otherworldly concept for for us. I was going to say with different like classes other than samurai, wouldn't your whole game be completely constricted by like the feudal sort of like the caste system like you wouldn't there's just stuff you wouldn't be able to do if you were being realistic about it as like an RPG like I mean fair enough a samurai can like go off and fight some battles or whatever but like how how does it give it like an RPG feel but with that those kind of restrictions placed on you well you, uh, case wise you are a samurai as in you so are that from, is, the, you're from the noble a, caste so you're from that so you're not you have some kind of you have to be book care simply because if you're if you're your lower case, whether you're a Hamin, you're a Hinin, yeah. you're, you're not really fully human as far as Rockigan goes. Yeah. You're legally speaking a, a, a sword sharpening tool um, and a cogwheel yeah. of the mechanism that actually feeds the one that, that sh- you should be playing as. You're, you're you're supposed to play as a samurai, and with your samurai can have many different. Jobs, I would say. You oh, can, right, you can okay. be a sword-carrying samurai, or you can be a, a spell-casting samurai. You can be a, a samurai who's, who resides at, at the court and essentially just schemes this sort of thing. Right. But I you're just, always of noble blood. It was just because you mentioned earlier about like merchants and things like that. Um, well, because this is a fantasy, uh, you're going to have some some samurai uh, families that actually double in. Right. Um, so the, your job's always... You, but you're always basically... Think about it as, as RPG classes. Right. Um, some of these uh, samurai families and schools will have different speci- specializations. Um, <clears throat> so you're still a samurai, yeah? Yeah. Which is important because in Rockigan, um, cases are just about everything. And you're, uh, if, if you want to be realistic, you want to actually look down at, at all the common folk Um and just think about them as your your lessers. It's you know it's it's just authentic to be racist. That's, in the that's legend what they're the putting into this this book about how to play the game. Then how to be racist. how to be racist. 
You know what? Oh, there is, which is which is actually, in my opinion, I hope that's not what the uh, rather the, nice. There is the there part is, of the rule book is it doesn't say at the top how to be racist. How to be racist politely? <laughs> or, well, sorry. Is essentially <laughs> how is to be culturally sensitive. <laughs> is essentially uh, this book, and there is warnings about it in the book, which is important in the modern day okay, right. age. Cool. This this game takes part in a fantasy, obviously setting, but also. You're surrounded by players who may be uh, affected by it, and in, in, you know, in, a, in different ways. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, mature themes. Um, it can happen just about anywhere. Um, you get your. Uh, huh. Yeah, this is a is this a topic for another time when I get to talk well, about I mean, RPG, guess, which is I mean, no, when, no, 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 when players me- are being. Asses. Sorry, I, I, I just I just gave Pavel the signal oh, that is it, this, this is has that gone on for a while. Like, but, problem uh, with this game, then. No, it's a pro- frequent problem in RPG. RPG give games, give right. a give a give a player the ability to to do anything, and the first thing they do is burn a village and uh, and hurt all the innocents. What about demands drunkenly demand sausages and then like and shoot a the, flagon of brandy out of the air? Well, and then spew this, up and be had to be. Tied to your horse. <laughs> this is this is Ewan's experience with his character in Pathfinder. And all this happened to me. <laughs> yeah, it did. It I, did. I think it happens to hmm. quite a lot of. Uh, I know. I, I, I mean, paid for my action. In, in that game of Pathfinder, I'm absolutely shocked that in that last uh, session we played, which was a few months ago now, that they didn't just slaughter all the lizard men they came across. I think we're, we're it's slowly the first learning. time that you've walked in somewhere and not just killed everybody. I think they were just tired. Uh, as you and may have mentioned, I was mostly observing. Uh, I tend to be <laughs> passive, uh, aggressive when it comes to group uh, gameplay. I stand in the back. I allow, I allow myself to be defended by the group, uh, whilst judging their actions. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, they, they they weren't ready to slay them. This would be the reason. All right. Okay. okay. Well, I mean, let's lock this down, Pavel. Bef- before we go, move on. The Legend of Five Rings. Why should I not rather just sit and play a uh, Shogun board game by myself while also playing Onimusha on the PlayStation 2 well, instead? Uh, I, think, be a more I think this is, this is a very uh, good, also slightly existential question. Why should you play RPG or mm. a board game or a video game? Now, the only correct game. answer is you should play uh, uh, an RPG game and possibly sell all your other belongings to, to afford it. Okay. So, so that this is yeah. That's but Pavel, much... sure you don't need anything to play an RPG game. You just pretend to be somebody else. You just have to have your mind. Yeah. Should, but... should you and sell all his belongings and clothes, and then just sit in the street pretending to be someone else? Mm. If you pretend you have clothes, you, well, who, you, you know. may as well have them. <laughs> a set of mechanics uh, is optional, possibly important, and a well-defined and well-described world is an absolute. Key, what about uh, a, a bottle of vodka? Would that help? A bottle of vodka does not help an RPG. Think about it as uh, as, as using the very it. same bottle of vodka and pouring it down on on your hardware. <laughs> it, it's like it starts to malfunction. That's what I call it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I'm trying to put a stop to this because we need to move on. Which oh. is fine. But, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that <laughs> I've only question. started, and there is about two more reviews of the legend. <laughs> Just sorry, one question. Um, is this the game that you put the picture of the dice up on your Twitter feed? Yes. 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 It is. yes. Those, those are nice dice. Yes, and and I have much to to talk about them, so I'll be lobbying to be allowed to to talk about the legend of the five rings again. Because I've not even scratched the surface yet. <laughs> you say that with every RPG. The thing is, if we let you talk about an RPG for as long as you possibly wanted to, uh, this episode would be hours long. You're quite right, and I ha- I don't mind at all doing it uh, episodically. That's it. See, that was originally why we brought you on the podcast in the first place. I mean, originally <laughs> you were just a contributor that was just going to send us little chunks. But you couldn't even be trusted to do that. No, no, so I, I don't do little So I actually physically chunks. drag you in here and get you to just sit and talk <laughs> in front of the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Ah, ah, good times, good oh, times. Yes. <laughs> just for big chunks. <clears throat> anyway, yes, we definitely have to move on. So that is Legend of the Five Rings, Pavel? Well, yes, yes it was. Okay, and that is by Fantasy Flight Games? Uh, yep, and uh, this was just the beginning. And this is the latest edition of it, which only... Was released a few months ago, I believe. I would say so, yes. Okay. 
I'm glad that we've uh, cleared all of that up. Thank you. My pleasure. I feel like I've essentially told you guys nothing about the Legend of the Five Rings yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. fine. I'll be back. Okay, so next up, we're going to talk about Hand of Fate or Deals, which is a game that all three of us played. Wow, that, yeah. that um, does not happen often. Somebody be- in this room won. Yeah, there's a wee bit of history of this this game. This this game's perfect for our podcast because we do video games and board games. And this game, despite it being a card game, originally started off as a video game. This is confusing. Um, it's a really fun video game. I really enjoyed it. I haven't played the second one. Yeah, I've only played the first one, so I'll just say that. I don't know what's changed in the second one. Um, but essentially, in the first game, it was a it was it was kind of like a rogue style game. Definitely on the fringes of rogue games, but it was essentially the only thing Chris ever plays. Yeah, pretty much. It seems to be that that's just one of my favourite gaming categories. I don't know how this has happened, but it's just you against a dealer. So this uh, masked dealer who's very mysterious, and you know you always feel that he might be slightly evil. Deals a bunch of cards out on a table essentially, and you've got a little deck yourself, um, and. You move across the cards, the cards are different locations, and whenever you come up against an encounter um, against like some enemies, it puts you into a fully 3D sort of action uh, combat situation where you're actually swinging against a bunch of skeletons or bandits or anything like that. It's a really fun game. If you haven't played it, I would recommend checking it out because it definitely does sit in the uh, in our podcast territory. But this is the actual board game version of it, which is a Kickstarter, which yeah, I definitely backed when I saw it because I thought, you know, if this game ever came out as a board game, I want to play it. I have to say, it's not disappointed me. It definitely feels like the the video game, um, and you can play this game. Uh, there, uh, there's different ways you can play the game. So there is like a campaign thing that you can do, and there's like the competitive mode, and there's a cooperative mode. There's even a a mode where you can do a one versus many, so that one person plays as the dealer. Because um, in every other mode, you're just playing against the game essentially. So yeah, this game came through. It had a few problems with the delivery of it. Um, they are fixing this. I have to say that they are fixing this and they are they're doing their best to fix it. But I, I am missing some of the Kickstarter components that I was supposed to get. Oh, are you? Yes, um, I was supposed to get special like food tokens and all those kind of things. They, they aren't there. You don't need them to play the game. These are just bling, basically. Ah. But uh, they are fixing it. I have to, I'll say that up front that they're doing their best to actually fix this. But it's it's happened to a lot of backers. Um, I think it seems that there may have been some damage uh, in transport. To some of the boxes and the games themselves, uh, which is sad, and it's completely out of the hands, I think, of the people that made it. This is just one of these things that can happen. Uh, but people have finally been getting these, and it was worth the wait. Uh, this this has been one of the, my favourite games I've played this year so far. It's good uh, fun, definitely. Yeah. So essentially, it's very much like the, the video game, in that you lay some cards out as locations. Are there a lot of cards in this game? Shall we agree on this? Quite a lot of cards. Quite a lot of cards in this game. Um, everybody starts with the same deck. It has, I think, seven of one card in it. Um, it has a couple of get food cards and one attack card, essentially. The other seven cards are essentially like action point cards. When it's your turn, you've got five cards in your hand of your ten card deck that you start with. You've got five cards in your hand. And you can use... Uh, your food cards to get get yourself some food tokens. Um, The food tokens you need to move to different locations. You don't really need them, actually, because you can just move to another location and take some health drop. Um, Essentially, you'll just starve yourself while you're uh, moving around. You can use the the action point cards to buy different cards for your deck. So at the top of the board, there is a row of six cards, I believe it is, that come from this big main deck. And these are things that you can use to upgrade your deck because this is a deck building game. Uh, and these can just be better better attacks. They can be better uh, action point cards, better food cards. There are equipment cards as well. Um, so every player has their own board, which has a, a bunch of spaces on it for, you know, body armor, uh, weapons, you know, offhand. Um, there are things like this, like hands and feet and stuff like that, isn't there? Yeah, there was, there was like helmets. Helmets, uh, yep. yeah. There's a trinket thingy. Trinkets, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, so there's just spaces on this board where you uh, basically equip your character up. Um, now, what's interesting, I like, what I like about this um, is the way that the combat works because you your attack cards, they don't really work the way you think that they do in a sort of normal game and that you have to actually attach them to your weapon. 
Um, and the longer you keep them attached to your weapon, the more it costs you every turn. So if you at- attach one attack card to your weapon, um, at the start of every one of your turns, you're going to have to spend some of your action points to keep that card. The more cards you have, the more action points you have to spend. Uh, so you can gear yourself up. Essentially, this is like your character just sort of like getting himself psyched up, I suppose, to get ready <laughs> for a fight. Uh, but he has to sort of keep maintain that level, essentially, of madness. And then once you actually get into a fight, you can then use all the attack cards that you have attached to your weapon. So the the locations, they're all different. They're all unique. Uh, You tend to start off in a tavern, I believe, in the end. Um, And you can move around from there. And the game, I mean, we played the the competitive mode, which they recommend for your first game. And it kind of has a layout that you put all the cards down. And there's like nine locations or something, isn't there? On, at the beginning. And on and, and each level or something like that. Nine eight or nine. Um seven and the second level and possibly eight yeah. on the third. I, I may get bigger. I can't remember exactly how it works. But yeah, you're you're moving to these different locations and each location might have something different that you can do in it. Oh, I only remember that there were uh, essentially places like uh um a guy that can actually heal you for your food items, uh, some form of princess, or a, possibly a unicorn uh, or a fusion of those two that could uh, <laughs> the maiden. Could... Yes, yeah. that was it. There that... was like, I mean, there was basically it was it was a kind of toss up between things that would like little challenges or sort of things that would give you some kind of bonus or actual like battles, some of which were ambushes. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm trying to remember some of like the specific. There were certain things that yeah, like the healing that like you were saying. There was there was like do a deal with the devil or something like that, and you yeah. could give the, like all your stamina. And you maybe. But you're right, actually. The, this this was actually this, they they were fusions of of places and events because yeah. m- most of these uh, or quite a lot of these uh, cards could only be uh, encountered once, twice, or, or three times, and when you've used up the the tokens uh, laid out on them. They would then just become, I suppose, placeholders that you can walk through, but without any actual s- special mm, characteristics. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then that's just a, your your regular fantasy sort of settings. Now, uh, one of the things I like the locations. Some of them are like, in fact, m- most of them were uh, a specific number of uses. So you could only yeah. use the thing in that location a number of times. Even if it's combat, you could go there and fight a number of times. But it tells you on the card how many times you can do it. And there's little cubes that you use to keep track. There's always little cubes in every game. <laughs> um, exactly. game. But there is one thing, like uh, like this game, they've used a lot of the sort of tarot deck influence. And when it comes to actually fighting enemies, you're not, you know, just fighting enemies that are listed on location you have to draw cards from a deck and the deck has you know they're they're like suits they're like a card suit so it's like they've got you might be fighting the two of skulls or the four of dust or whatever and, and the two of skulls that's two skeletons essentially as as it would be in the video game um but it's just it's, it's a wee bit more sort of simplified in the board game version and it needs to be uh because the two of skulls is like you know weaker than the four of skulls is essentially so it, they just have a certain number of ways that you a certain number of hit points essentially, and uh, they they might have different abilities depending. Um, the the scales cards, for example, they tend to be the lizard men sort of people, um, and they have defense. They have really defensive capabilities, so they can you know ignore some of the hits that you do on them or whatever. I really dust. like that idea. Yeah, so the dust, the, the, the dust, the dust. dust, the, dust were like, they are the dust bandits. Yeah, yeah. And now, there was something plague. The plague, yeah, yeah, that was the other one. That's the rat people. Um, so those are like the four sort of main suits. There are other cards in the game that you can add in, um, but I think they kind of save those for some of the campaign modes. But I really, yeah, I really, I really liked uh, the way that they've done that. The way that they've sort of translated that from the video game into the board game, and it is just essentially, you know, like I say, the higher the number is, the harder it is to be going to be to defeat them. Yeah. Um, but you may be asking, what's the purpose of all this? Well, the purpose is that you have to defeat. The king. So there's a jack, a queen, and a king, which is another aspect I really love about this game. Um, and they are randomly decided before the start of the game. You don't know who you're going to come up against. So as soon as you start the game, you flip the jack card over, and it could be you know the jack of skulls, the jack of uh, scales, whoever. Again, it's the same suits. So once you find the jack who is hiding in one of the locations on the board, 
um, you have to fight him. And he'll bring some minions with him. It can be a pretty tough fight. Well, the Jack, not quite so tough as the Queen and the King are. Mm. Um, once the Jack's dead, everybody moves down to the next level. And then you're hunting the Queen. And then you move down to the next level and then you're hunting the King. And whoever kills the King wins the game. Actually, not not really. Whoever ends up with the biggest amount of fame wins the game. Well, yes, that is that is one way of looking at it. There's, there is <laughs> there is fame in this game. We were just kind of like, nah, whoever kills the king wins the game. <laughs> but um, but the, yeah, there is a fame thing in this game. So yeah, you do get points. So your cards all have fame points on them. Um, killing certain people will give you fame points. You know, doing certain tasks will give you fame points. Um, and yeah, whoever has the most fame points wins the game. But we were just kind of playing it as a chase the king and kill him, um, which is you know you do what you want with it. Uh. Um, but the whole time that you're doing this, the whole time that you're playing through doing all these things, you're constantly upgrading your deck. You're like getting new equipment. There's legendary equipment. You know, whenever you like defeat, say the Jack, for example, you'll get shards. These shards are like currency in the game, but the currency is actually quite rare. Yeah, it's it's not like something that you're finding all the time. Um, and these shards you can use to buy legendary equipment um, every time you kill one of the royalty. You people have a chance to buy legendary equipment with uh, with their shards. Uh, we didn't really see that much of it. I think, Pavel, did you buy a ring or something? I had a ring which was actually quite useful in the final uh, fight. But other than that, I think this was the only actual artifact we used. Yeah, I think so. I don't think, maybe uh, because this was just a tutorial scenario thingy. Well, yeah, that's the thing. So I'm, I'm actually interested in playing through the... Because I think the game is designed to be played cooperatively rather than competitively. It kind of feels that way. The competitive one kind of... It's sort of hamstrung the game a bit because you end up, you know, you're whoever kills the... Uh, the, the king. The king or the whichever. You know, you, you're sort of moving, moving on basically at your pace rather than, you know, as working as a team kind of... Yeah, yeah, that was the thing, because it, it, it did definitely feel like people were racing. Like, I felt like I was constantly dragging behind in this game. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a lot of that was to do with, like, just me not getting the cards I needed when it came down to it, essentially. It was just like, well, I can't move because I don't have enough food or whatever. Um, and I think in the cooperative mode, you can end up passing equipment to each other, doing all that kind of thing. So, yeah, the, I, I, I want to play the cooperative mode. Uh, Pavel, sorry, were you going to say something? I was just going to say that maybe it was just your bad strategy. Oh, well, there's always that. I mean, I'm always open to that idea. <laughs> I mean, it was an interesting game for that point, because you know, it did seem there was like a lot of chance in it. Um, but yeah. It never, because, but it seemed to be like, oh, deliberate things. We're using this card mechanic. We're using this deck mechanic. And it, it was like, it, I don't know, it felt like... I mean, hands down, the only reason why I won was because I got, I got a very lucky combo just when I needed it. Oh, yeah. But yeah, but I mean, that's, that's deck builders yeah. for you, is to essentially, that's what you're looking for when you're playing a deck building game. You're looking for these big ah. combos that you can set up. And there are ways in this game that, like, like in a lot of deck building games, that you can get rid of cards in your hand, uh, in your deck, uh, as you go through, so that you are more likely to pick up the more powerful cards by getting rid of the cards that aren't as powerful, essentially. Um... I didn't use that so much. I think. Uh, did you guys use that I've, ability? I, I, can't, I think I got one through like doing one of the location things. Um, I was able. To I don't destroy, think a lot of it happened. Uh, I was able to destroy a card, and it was. It, I mean, it was useful. We got aye, something in my hand, but you know, yeah, I guess that is a part of the game, particularly if you're playing it more long term. To like really yeah, yeah, yeah. parts. I mean, I, if if I didn't use the ability to remove one of the curses in my deck, I would have ended up with four curses in my deck. Yeah. That's it. I still have three, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that tends to come up more more frequently than healing. Yeah. I found the destroying cards. It appeared on a lot of, like, location things. There were certain, I can't remember, certain events to let you do it. Um, yeah, it's, 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 I think there's, with the element of chance, there's still that, like, satisfaction of building your character and, like, you know, improving your deck and everything. I like the combat as well. The combat is nice, and I was just going to bring that up, actually. The combat um, is an interesting thing, because you actually, when you get into a fight, you draw, like I say, you draw the the, card, the creatures you're fighting from a deck, um, but what you do is you look at what cards you've equipped to your weapon, and then you draw a bunch of we- uh, cards on top of that, and it's your weapon that determines how many cards you draw. And I really like that idea that you can have these weapons that have different things because some of them you can only attach a certain number of cards to them and then you draw a certain number of cards as well on top of that. Um, so yeah, there's different little balancing things going on there with the weapons. 
but it doesn't really matter what you draw when you're like uh, told to draw cards for combat because you essentially just take all the cards you draw and attach them to your weapon and whatever points are on them you add that on unless it's food I don't think I, I, I didn't get a clear answer on this but I think that the food cards don't add to your attack score but then you're just looking at how much attack score you've got and then comparing it to the the enemy and then you may be able to kill one of them I think it is really simple but I mean it's like the whole the mechanic gives it some kind of depth. I kind of like how simple it is, yeah, because yeah. there are still some little things, like I say, like the, the scales guys have little defensive things, and the plague guys might end up poisoning you in some way. Um, so there are little things there that add to it, but I like how simple they kept it. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, it is just literally Because it keeps just, things moving. Yeah. I mean, literally, the combat, you're, you're trying to get higher than the total number yeah, yeah, like the yeah. card, like the the totals of the enemies, and it's it's really simple. It's quite clear what you're supposed to be doing. The other thing I'll say is I really like the artwork in this game. Oh yeah, like, <laughs> the artwork is brilliant. It's beautiful. It's it's some of the the artwork on the cards, like the the action cards and stuff that you have. I really like the way that it's like a an old school like D and D rule book from like the eighties or something like that. It's just black and white line art essentially some of it mm. um, and I really like that it's just it, it goes so well with the the game very nicely drawn it's, it's very nice and, and there are there is some more elaborate artwork in this game I mean I mean the box itself is, yeah. is really nice um, which is important in card games let's face it oh yeah definitely definitely um, I should say that I've also got as part of the, ex, the ex Kickstarter I've got the royalty expansion now in the base game you have one campaign that you can play through there are other ways you can play the game you can just play a straight up random uh, random enemies game like we did. But there is a campaign where specific cards and stuff will be on the table and all that kind of thing. And there, these are things that we didn't even see because they're set aside. You don't use them. And the Royalty expansion, uh, you get more campaigns. So in the base game, it's like, I think it's the Skulls campaign that you can play through. But I think in the Royalty expansion, you end up getting the Scales, the Plague, and the Dust campaign on top of that as well. So you can play through and do some sort of like proper... Or like, like it's... It, I've had a look through them, Pavel, and it looks kind of similar to the way like the Arkham Horror card game does its campaigns. Oh, that's pretty cool. So there are specific things that happen and, you know, specific uh, things that you're trying to do um, and they, through each level. And they sort of branch out. And I don't know if they branch out. I think it is just one after another, but it's right. it's got these sort of, like, limitations on each level, if you see what I mean. Very cool. Um, I, I quite enjoyed this aspect yes. of uh, card games. Good, good. Me too, and I'm looking forward to actually giving one of the campaigns a go. The other thing I'm looking forward to having a go at, and this might actually... I'm not I'm not somebody that plays games solo. I would be tempted to do it with this game, because I actually think that it's... The game's just nice for that, I think. It's yeah. it's set up for, for that kind of thing. There is an endless mode where you can just keep playing the game. <laughs> ah, that's pretty <laughs> cool. <laughs> and I don't know how, how it works exactly, but uh, I had a quick flick through. I didn't see, like how far you're supposed to go, what you're trying to achieve or anything like that. But um, I'm I'm well up for giving the Endless Mode a go Absolutely. one day. I mean, just, that, sit, just sit for about six, seven, eight hours and just only play a hand of fate. Uh, deck, deck building games are really uh, sort of blossom in the long game yeah, when yeah, you actually exactly. have yeah. time to invest some ideas, not just luck, um, into, into your deck and, and polish into something you really want it to be. You, you, you get to feel it in Arkham Horror once you've played, I don't know, six or seven games, yeah. and you're just about to finish your campaign. Your deck is so much different from what you started with. Right, excellent. Uh, so, Hand of Fate or Deals, um, big thumbs up from me. I really like this game. Really enjoyed it. Well, I have one, yeah. so hey. It's a, <laughs> it's a top one. It's, yeah, I can happily play that all day. Yep, definitely. I'm tempted um, to actually get it for myself. <laughs> you don't need to, Pavel. I've got it. What? <laughs> okay, so that is, yes, yeah, Hand of Fate Ordeals. Um, it is designed by Michael McIntyre, not the comedian, but, uh, well, What's I call going him on a with comedian. the game designer names? I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, this Michael McIntyre is otherwise known as Barantis, apparently. Barantis. So uh, we've got think... Michael McIntyre, John Wick, is making an RPG. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, and that is uh, published by Rule and Make. Okay. okay, so we've got one other quick thing to talk about now. Uh, this is Thebes by Queen Games. Um, this is something that we have touched on because we did play the card game version of it 
um, a while ago. Now, I'm talking maybe about two years ago, possibly yeah. more that we talked about that on the podcast. It's been a and while. We, we have played this before as well. We have played Thieves, the board game as well. Um, and we did sort of reference the two. But we, this is the first time that we've actually sat and played it since then, I think. It looks very exciting. It's a, it's a game for eight players or more, aged two to four. Yeah, I think you've got that the wrong way around. Oh, man. <laughs> It's for two or four players, ages eight and up, and takes 60 minutes. It's a genuine mistake. Yeah. Thieves is, uh, on its face of it, a fairly simple game. You're basically just digging up various archaeological sites in uh, Egypt, Greece, Crete. Uh, Palestine and Mesopotamia. Yeah, there we go. Um, and yeah, you're basically you have out your little um, archaeologist man with his little hat, uh, meeple thing. That you're moving around uh, sort of Europe and uh, Moscow, various places, uh, gathering inf- information about these uh, dig sites. Um, you'll get these in the form of cards that you basically they'll give you a um, one. Of, there'll be a color assigned to each of the. Um, there is a color for each of the the dig sites, and you'll get books, well, cards with like book symbols on it that have that color. Um, there's also sort of wild card ones as well that you can they'll add to your sort of knowledge if you already have uh, some knowledge in a particular place. Um, there's various other things. There's like cards that gives you sort of conference cards that you can collect and they give you points at the end of the game. There's um, rumor cards that are sort of one use only, give you knowledge for a particular dig. Uh, basically, the, the way that you acquire these cards, and this is a kind of interesting mechanic in this game, definitely. Um, you it takes place over three years if you're playing. It's, it's only two years if you're playing a four-player game. Yeah, it? that's right. Yeah. So you have um, the fifty-two weeks sort of marked out because it looks like you're looking. You think it, and you you look at it, and you think, oh, it's a um, victory point counter, but it's actually you know it's fifty-two, and it's uh, yeah to basically you use this counter to mark how long you're taking to do something. So. You take one week to move between locations, and you'll uh, each card you have you pick up um, is going to have a, a time sort of amount on that a number of weeks it's going to take to pick up that card to basically to acquire that knowledge. Uh, so yeah, you when you take your action and you pick up a card, or you move whatever you do, you're going to move your mark your piece along that sort of uh, that tracker, and that's going to don't. Do you know who uh, is going to be the next player? And it gets really interesting this because you can take lots of short moves and you'll have maybe you can have maybe two, two possibly three goes in a row. Yeah. Uh, depending on how far people are ahead. Um, the other thing that's going to take up time is when you actually go on the digs. So when you go on a, a dig, and this is where it's the main the sort of meat of the game is, you have these bags. Uh, I think in the card game, you, it was basically you had a deck set up for this. I think um, so, yeah. And you would basically in this card, in this uh, in this bag, you've got all your counters. They represent the various treasures you can find at each uh, each site, and a lot of blank ones that just uh, represent dirt. So when you go to a dig site, depending on how much knowledge you've acquired, you you have a little disc that explains that. I quite like that they've given you discs rather than just putting a. a, a a chart a complicated on a chart, somewhere. yeah. <laughs> just some boring chart. The a disc nice, is just a complicated disc, chart and disc form, oh, yeah, but it, it totally does simplify is. it. But it, it's fun. Um, so yeah, based on your knowledge, uh, you can, it's actually, it actually does have like a maximum of 12. You, you're you going to look at, you're going to basically spin the dial on the disc round to correspond with your however much knowledge you have in that dig site. And then you, you're going to look down the, there's sort of dial on there, uh, and it's got number of weeks spent. I think there's a maximum of like, is it 10, 12 possibly on that as well? Not too sure. I could look at it. It's uh, 12, I think, is the maximum number of weeks you can spend, I believe. Ah, but that's basically going to chart um, how many, between those two things, how many uh, of the tokens you can pick out of the bag. And you'll draw these at random. And you get to keep whatever treasures you find, which will be worth a certain number of victory points. And any dirt you pick up, that just goes back in the bag, and it makes it more difficult for the next person who comes along trying to try to dig out and find stuff. 
And that basically covers how you play the game. Well, that's it. You just keep playing until yeah. uh, everybody runs out of time and yeah, the 1903 the end ends. So, yeah. And then at the, the end of the game, you count up how like your artifacts, you count up the, the conference cards, like you said. Um, there is also points for the specialist knowledge. So the, the people with the most points of knowledge in each area will score points for that, um, which ended up being a game swinger when we played it yeah. uh, the other night there. Um, but yeah, that's it. I mean, it's it's a very simple... I mean, it's a simple game. I wouldn't say it's very simple, but it's a simple game. Yeah. Um, and the reason we broke this game out and didn't play anything sort of newer or more complicated is because uh, we had somebody around who was only just kind of getting into games. Um, he'd only really played a couple of things. I think he's maybe played Carcassonne and uh, maybe Settlers of Catan or something like that. We didn't want to, like, you know, throw him in at the deep end and tell him that he's playing uh, Twilight Imperium. <laughs> so we... We got this game out because we hadn't just hadn't played it in years, um, and despite the fact he didn't do well in it, he really enjoyed it. Um, it's a fun game. I mean, I did I, I did terribly in it. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I got absolutely slaughtered every time I went to go. I was like, right, I'm prepared for this. I'm that's gonna go it. This dig and I just drew a load of dirt. Well, that's it. This game, there was a lot of luck in this game. Quite frustrating. There was a lot of luck in this game, and this is not a game where you can have like a long term strategy that's definitely going to work. Like it's just like when it comes down to the to doing the digs, yeah. Um, that's just that's a luck of the draw thing. And yeah, and, and one of the things about this game, though, it is just kind of trying to like you know weigh things up a bit and try and decide when's the best time to go and dig and how long you're going to spend digging and like you know there, you can do sort of wee strategy things there. But at the end of the day, when it comes to like drawing the tiles, you could just end up you could draw ten tiles and still only get dirt. Oh yeah, yeah. So. Uh, there's just no guarantee that you're going to score points for your digs. Um, for some, I can see why this would be frustrating for yeah. some people, but I mean, this is a, a light game. It doesn't take long to play. You shouldn't get annoyed by it. You know, it's, I, it's not. I, it's I not, mean, I'm guessing as well, that, that, like because you were saying about the um, like having the most local knowledge, because um, you get quite a lot of points. Five points for that. Like, five I, points each. I mean, that's kind of a way, I guess. The Mitigated the, the yeah yeah because like, yeah. you could uh, again you could end up drawing nothing you know, having quite a lot of knowledge at least there's some kind well, of compensation. For I it. think it's fair to say that I was the the most successful when it came to the digs. Oh, you, you were ridiculous, but I still lost <laughs> because all of my knowledge was in one area in particular, and I got very lucky with my other digs. Yeah, but it's just the fact that uh, James, who we were playing with, uh, because he had the most knowledge in like three of the places, uh, three of the five places I think, or possibly four of them. Um, no, I think it was three of the five places. He scored just enough points to get ahead of me, so he was two points ahead of me by the end. Ah. Um, and just that, like I say, that was the game swinger. It was yeah. just the fact that because I'd spent all my time just concentrating on Palestine and nowhere else. Uh, well, so he did very little digging as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, yeah, that's it. But it's just that he, he had a he had a load of co- conference cards, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, he just he managed to... They managed to just sneak ahead of me on these little bonus points that you get. Mm. Um, well done, James. Yeah. I really like the time uh, mechanic in the game that you that's explained. Great. I really like that. I really like the way... Like That's a really simple idea, and yeah, it works really well. I really like how... It's, it works thematically. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, which I like. It I, also changes the way, to some extent, how you think about the game. Or, you know, playing a game where normally... You do tend to just yes. break things down into, into rounds, and you know how long things are going. You don't. I mean, I fair enough. You can kind of sit there and try and calculate it all out and look at. But you, because you're drawing out random cards, you're constantly changing your plans. So you really don't know yeah. how many turns you're going to have to do yeah, anything that's, in this game. That's really good, and you, and you could end up doing like a like a really long dig. You could go like, "That's it. I'm going to do like a twelve week dig," and you don't get a turn for about ten minutes. Like yep. people, everybody else is get four or five turns before you go again. <laughs> um, but the turns are really quick as well, so it's not like you're sitting there forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just the it's just the way that the time mechanic works, and it's offset by the fact that because you did a really long dig, you've probably scored a lot of points out of that. So you know you can you're quite happy to sit and wait. Yeah. Wait your turn out. Uh, w- wait for your turn to come back around again. Um. Yes, Thebes. It's a classic. Yeah. Um, That's Thebes. It's a classic, and I'm glad we broke it out because every time I play this game, I just have fun with it. It's re- it's not heavy. It's just quite relaxing. You know, it doesn't take long to play. It's a queen game, so it's colourful, um, nice good. artwork, all that kind of thing, uh, nice pieces. I like the little silk bags that you've got. Um, no silk, sorry, the linen bags um, that have all the little things in. 
the whole the whole thing. It's it's a fun game. Any um, game in the bag. and nice and light. Ah, well, that's Thebes. Pavel does Jeffrey Rush. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's Peter, Peter Prince. Peter Prince Peter Design Prince. Thebes. That uh, came out in 2007. So it is a few years old now in board gaming terms. Um, and like we say, it is by Queen Games. Good game, good game. Okay, well, that, that is going to be the end of the episodes. We will say we are not sure at this point if there's going to be an episode next week. We are due a video games episode next week. It is becoming a scheduling nightmare. Let's just say that right now. Um, we're going to do our best to get one out to you, but the the if if this if the next video games episode doesn't turn up, um, it will be out the week after instead. But we will give out all our internet details. Um, if you want to email us, you can do so at firstplayertoken at gmail.com. That's F-I-R-S-T, player token. Um, you can find us on all the social media things. I'm not going to go through them all again, but uh, we are all on we are on most of them. Um, if you want to give us chat, then Twitter's the place to go. So you can find us on Twitter. Uh, that's 1ST, player token. That's once the player token. Thank you, Ewan. I don't know if we're still doing that. We are still doing that. Um, that is also our Twitch page, but we're not really doing very much with that right now. Um, however, me and Dave have been streaming stuff, so we uh, you can find my Twitch at Unnecessary Chris, and Dave has now set up a new Twitch, which is Unnecessary Dave, which is nice. Um, we wanted to get Pavel to do the same thing, but instead he wanted to call himself Large Pavel. And, and, and suddenly the idea became less attractive. It, it really did, because ah. you, you have to be different, Pavel, don't you? Yes. You, you yeah. can't just... I'm, you can't I'm just so be happy the same you've noticed. with all your comrades. What? I've emigrated from the comradeship. <laughs> um, our website will be back up and running finally. Uh, hopefully on the 1st of March. That's my goal, is to have it ready by the 1st of March. And we are on track for that, so we should have it ready by the 1st of March. Um, so that is firstplayertoken.com. There is a holding page there right now if you want to go and look at it and go, ooh. Um, and also, we are part of the Podnos Network. The UK's leading entertainment podcast network. Um, have you got anything to say about Podnos this week, Ewan? Well, I just um, I think what I'll do, just to kind of give Podnos a bit of a, a boost, is uh, just highlight a few of the shows. So if, I'll start off, I'm just going to go alphabetically, I think. I think this is alphabetically. Um, so this week, I'd like to mention The All Seeing Guys with Greg and Joe, which is actually one of Podnos' longest-running podcasts. Yep. And it's a kind of off-the-cuff uh Talking about anything, madcap show, but it's done uh, a couple of uh, radio plays now, which I've highlighted before. But yeah, check them out. Our stable mates at Podnos. Surely we must be one of the longest running Podnos podcasts. I think we actually point. might be. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I think just because of the relentlessness of our episodes, I think a few of them have taken breaks or like had split seasons and things like that. We just refused to months. give up. Oh yeah, <laughs> we just we just chunder on. <laughs> okay well that is it that is uh, episode 109 I had to think about what episode that was there there's too many these days too many episodes um, so we hopefully we'll be back next week but if not it'll be the week after but until then thanks for listening bye bye bye